Well, it's an especial delight to be able to be with you on this occasion as we reflect upon the riches of the Reformation and what that means to us today, and a process really that the uh, a French school of historians called uh, uh, Résorcement, which is a retrieval, uh, thinking and reflecting on the past and retrieving those riches uh, for present usage. Uh, it's also a special joy for me to be here because this is the first time I've ever been on the campus of uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and uh, obviously have heard great things over the years, have known of many of the teachers here, uh, appreciated their writings, and have had some friends who have graduated from here, and so it's, it's really thrilling to be here uh, in uh, this, uh, this context and in this context. Uh, like uh, Dr. Manetch, uh, I have uh, some general remarks I want to say about uh, preaching in the Reformation era, and then I'm going to focus on the a career, uh, the preaching career, of one such preacher, uh, Hugh Latimer, and the English Reformation, and draw uh, some reflections from his life that I hope are of value for us today. In the early days of the Reformation in Germany, Martin Luther reflected on why the Reformation truths that he and his colleagues were preaching and publishing were making such a deep impact on various parts of German-speaking Europe. To the biblicistic Luther, the answer was patent. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word, otherwise I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip, Philip Melanchthon, and Nicholas Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing, the word did everything. By emphasizing that the word did everything, Luther is not simply giving his own personal opinion, but he's making plain a vital theme in the history of the Christian faith as God renews and revives his church from time to time. In times of spiritual advance, the church is borne along by the word of God. As that word lays bare the secrets of human hearts and brings sinners to repentance and conversion. Speaking of this pattern in the history of the church, Ian Murray once put it this way, quote, the advance of the church is ever preceded by a recovery of preaching the word. The Reformation, a time of great spiritual advance, and really uh, a time of revival. We, we don't often think of it that way, but uh, it, it is a time of remarkable outpouring of the Spirit. In, uh, in France, in the mid-1520s, there were probably in the vicinity of 3,000 evangelicals, maybe 4,000. Forty years later, on the death of Calvin, there are two million in 40 years. And 50% uh, roughly of the upper class had, been, had embraced the Reformation, 50% of the middle class. And you had congregations like those at Charlotton, just outside Paris, with 15,000. It's definitely a time of revival, as well as doctrinal reformation. So some general points then about preaching in this period of time. First, the centrality of preaching during the Reformation is found in the fact that the leading term used by the reformers to describe leadership in the local church is not the word priest, understandably, which it had been in the medieval world, nor is it pastor, which it would be from the 18th century onwards, but preacher. The main reason for this was the conviction held by all the reformers that utterly central to ecclesial leadership was the preaching of the Word of God. When Luther, for example, singled out the main problem of the medieval church, he cited the fact that, quote, God's Word is not proclaimed. There is only reading and singing in the churches. Second, because God's Word has been suppressed, Many unchristian inventions and lies have sneaked into the service of reading and singing and preaching, and they are horrible to see. In this analysis, the ultimate failure of the medieval church lay in its refusal to preach the Word of God. And this entailed nothing less than profound religious error and the loss of the gospel. The English reformer Hugh Latimer, who we're going to look at in more detail, had a similar critique. 
Preaching is necessary for takeaway preaching and takeaway salvation. I told you of Scala Coli, the ladder of heaven, and I made it a preaching matter, not a massing matter. That is not a, a matter of masses. Christ is the preacher of all preachers, the pattern and exemplar that all preachers ought to follow. For it was he by whom the Father of heaven said, Hicus filius meus delectus ipsum audita. This is my well-beloved son. Hear him. For reformers like Luther and Latimer, there is little doubt that preaching was the central means of grace in ecclesial renewal and revival. For these men, along with the other reformers, hearing, this is the second kind of point, general point, hearing was the key sense of the Christian man and woman. Not the eye, but the ear. As the French reformer John Calvin stressed, genuine faith, quote, cannot flow from a naked experience of things, but must have its origin in the Word of God. Medieval Roman Catholicism had majored on symbols and images as the central means of teaching. The Reformation, coming hard on the heels of the invention of the printing press in the mid-15th century, turned back to a biblical emphasis on words spoken and written as the primary vehicle for cultivating faith and spirituality. As Calvin again aptly put it, quote, the word is the instrument by which the Lord dispenses the illumination of the Spirit to believers. End of quote. In the minds of the reformers, there could be neither true reformation nor genuine spirituality apart from the Scriptures. A third point. For the reformers, the preaching of the Scriptures was a mark of a true church. Luther puts it this way in 1523. The certain mark of the Christian congregation is the preaching of the gospel in its purity, end of quote. Sixteen years later, he made the same point when he maintained, whenever you hear or see this word preached, believed, confessed, and acted on, there do not doubt there must be a true, holy, Catholic church, a Christian, holy people. Similarly, Lewis Calvin could state, quote, Whenever we see the word of God purely preached and heard and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, it is not to be doubted a church of God exists, end of quote. Now, after those gen three very general remarks, I want to focus on really one preacher and kind of draw out further reflections from his life as a preacher of the gospel, and it is Hugh Latimer. Reformation scholar Susan Wabuda has described him as the greatest English-speaking preacher of the 16th century. J.C. Ryle, the Anglican bishop who uh, uh, wrote a number of small mini-biographies of a variety of the 16th century reformers, uh, gave the following reason for Latimer's importance and renown. If a combination of sound gospel doctrine, plain Saxon language, a lot of the 19th century evangelicals were into emphasizing plain Saxon language as opposed to Latinate language. Uh, you find it in Spurgeon as well as others, and here in Ryle. Boldness, liveliness, directness, simplicity can make a preacher. Few have ever equaled Latimer. In the 1560s, this is after Latimer's martyrdom, it was apparently a common saying in the university town of Cambridge, quote, when Master Latimer preached, then was Cambridge blessed. And according to Augustine Bernhair, a Francophone pastor who was mentored by Latimer and later pastored during the reign of Elizabeth I, if England ever had a prophet, he was one. So a little bit about his biography, and really what I'm going to be doing is kind of tracing his career, but focusing on his emphasis as a preacher. Hugh Latimer's father, also called Hugh Latimer, was a yeoman farmer in Thurkeston, a small town, small village in Leicestershire. According to his son's witness in a sermon he preached before Edward VI, and one of the, one of the main sources for, for Latimer's uh, life are these uh, uh, anecdotal biographical uh, inserts he'd regularly put in his preaching, completely different from Calvin. You could listen to Calvin 
uh, for most of his preaching career, and you'd learn very little about his personal life. It's Latimer, it's completely opposite. Uh, he's more like Luther in this regard. He'd often say things about his own background and his life. According to uh, Hugh Latimer's witness at a sermon he preached before Edward VI, his father was, quote, a yeoman who had not lands of his own, only had a farm of three or four pounds a year at the uttermost. The younger Latimer was the only son among seven siblings, so six older sisters. And having profited from an early education, he entered Clare Hall, now Clare College, at the University of Cambridge when he was 14. That's a frequent uh, 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 entry age. Uh, one d shouldn't think that all these men were geniuses. Uh, the university, a BA university education in that period of time is probably more equivalent to a high school degree. And that was around 1505, although there's great, great date, the great debate about exactly when he was born. Uh, born, according to that, then somewhere around 1490, uh, but some push it back all the way to 1485. He was at Clare College for the next 25 years or so, until 1530. He received a BA in 1510, his MA four years later in 1514. He would then go on to receive his MA. At the same time, he was ordained a priest in Lincoln to the north of Cambridge. And in 1524, he obtained his Bachelor of Divinity, which proved to be a key turning point in his life. Up until that event, he had been a staunch Roman Catholic. As he stated many years later in 1552 in one of his sermons, I was as obstinate a papist as any was in England. He was gifted in Latin, but like many in the Roman church of the late medieval world, he was neither deeply conversant with the Greek nor with Scripture. In fact, before his conversion and his encounter, and he encountered the study of Greek, he had deep suspicions about it. On one occasion, he urged his hearers, quote, study the school divines, do not meddle with scripture or Greek. Upon receiving the BD, though, he was expected to give a speech in which he would elaborate a theological position. He chose for his subject the teaching of Philip Melanchthon and delivered a blistering attack on the German reformer and co-worker of Luther. Among those listening to him that day, and the, the church uh, would be Great St. Mary. If you know Cambridge, it's right, right in the heart of Cambridge. That's uh, where Martin Butzer's, there's a gravestone of Butzer there. His body would, was later burned, but it's a very, very well-known church. Uh, it's the church, if you ever want to get a whole view of Cambridge, you have to clamber up the, the tower uh, to get that view. And as he was preaching in uh, Great St. Mary, there was a young man in the congregation uh, Thomas Bilney, who would die as a martyr in 1531, known as Little Bilney. He was under five feet tall. He was at Trinity College. He's one of the earliest of the Cambridge Reformers had embraced the doctrines of the Reformation uh, very early on, 1519, as he read Luther's writings. He was deeply concerned by what he heard Latimer say, recognized that Latimer really hadn't got a clue what Philip Melanchthon was teaching, and sought audience with him afterwards. Latimer would later say he learned more in the space of that conversation in one hour than he had learned in nearly 20 years of theological study. This probably, if you want to talk about his conversion, and I deeply appreciated Dr. George's emphasis that uh, the reformers were concerned about conversion. Uh, this is probably his conversion. He could say many years again later, all the papists think themselves to be saved by the law. I myself was of that dangerous, perilous, damnable opinion till I was 30 years of age. Again, that is 1524, so that would now date him around 15, uh, 1495. And so as, I, as you say, there's, there's a wide divergence as to exactly when he was born. More generally, he could state of his change in his life, if, I, if, if it were too long to tell you what blindness I've been in, how long it were ere I could forsake such folly, but by continual prayer, prayer, continual study of Scripture, and oft communing with men of more right judgment, God delivered me. Or again, as he said on another occasion, and I think this is, this is, so, this is so, uh, uh, so much of the essence of the Reformation. 
I am a Christian man, the child of everlasting joy through the merits of the bitter passion of Christ. The, the keynote joy there, and you come across it again and again and again in these reformers as they realize that faith in Christ has delivered them from all of the legalism of late medieval spirituality. Within a year of these events, he was accused of being a Lutheran. His bishop, Nicholas West, the Bishop of Ely, came to hear Latimer preach, snuck into the back of uh, Great St. Mary's on one occasion. Uh, Latimer saw him there and decided to change his sermon on the spot and preached on Christ as a model for bishops. <laughs> uh, West came to talk to him afterwards. He asked him, Will you refute the views of Martin Luther? Latimer told him, well, I can't refute what I don't know. He actually hadn't read any of Luther at that point. And West said to him, well, Mr. Latter, I perceive that you somewhat smell of the pan. In other words, you've been in the frying pan with Luther, and it's, you smell like him. You will repent this one day. Years later, in 1552, when Latimer had had the time to read Luther, he described him, quote, as a wonderful instrument of God through whom God hath opened the light of his holy word unto the world, which was a long time hid in corners and neglected. West went on to forbade Latimer to preach anywhere in the Diocese of Ely, which included Cambridge, as well as keeping, uh, uh, keeping his mouth shut at the university. But uh, Latimer had higher connections. Uh, he had friend, a friendship with Thomas Woolsey, the papal legate in Britain. And the papal uh, Woolsey heard about this uh, interview. He didn't like West, so he called uh, Latimer to see him and ex asked him to explain uh, what uh, had led to uh, West's uh, refusal to allow him to preach. Latimer made such an unfavorable impression upon Woolsey, and the papal legate gave him freedom to preach throughout England and declared, if the Bishop of Ely cannot abide such doctrine as you have repeated, you have my license and shall preach it unto his, uh, it preach it unto his beard. Let him say what he will. And so he was able to continue preaching in Cambridge. I mean, Wolsey's no friend of the Reformation, but he didn't like West. And so if West wasn't going to allow him to preach, he was going to allow him to preach. Now, this is, these are the years of what's known as the king's privy matter, the king's private matter, King Henry VIII, and namely his marriage. Uh, very quickly, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Henry had been married because uh, his, uh, his older brother, Arthur, had been married by their father, Henry VII, to a Spanish Roman Catholic princess, Catherine of Aragon. When, she, when Arthur died of tuberculosis uh, very early on in the marriage, Henry wanted to maintain the alliance with Spain, and so he asked the Pope, Julius II, uh, for a special dispensation to allow his so second son to marry uh, Catherine of Aragon, and so it was given in return for a certain sum of money that was sent to Rome. The only problem was, from Henry's point of view, his, his wife couldn't bear him a son. He needed a son desperately so that England would not be plunged into civil war upon his death. He didn't believe that the daughter that uh, Catherine of Aragon had borne him, Mary I, who will come into our story later, uh, would be able to ru rule England. And so uh, when it became obvious to him by the mid-1520s, Catherine couldn't bear a, a son. Now, we know we have gynecological knowledge now. It could have well been his fault, but that's a man's world. And uh, it was her problem. And so he pressed the, the, the Pope uh, for an annulment, because he had discovered a verse in Leviticus which indicated that thou shalt not marry thy brother's wife, and obviously the marriage was under the curse of God. And the Pope would have given it to him. Clement VII would have readily given it to him for a sum of money. But the only problem was Catherine of Aragon was the aunt of the most powerful man in Europe, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, King of Spain. And Charles V told the uh, Pope, if you give that man, Henry, an annulment and shame my aunt in the whole face of Europe. It'll be the last thing you ever do as Pope. And so the Pope was caught between, as we say, at a rock and a hard place, or the devil in the deep blue sea. Uh, both interesting sayings. I've got no idea where they come from, but 
you all know what I mean. Now, by the late 1520s, Henry's getting antsy. He's, he's, got, to, he's got to solve this matter. And he spoke to a man named Stephen Gardner, a very significant uh, figure. He would be a major opponent of the Reformation. He would burn a number of the Reformers. And uh, you've got to find a solution to this. And so it was Stephen Gardner uh, began to talk to a number of people. One of the people he talked to was Thomas Cramner, the future Archbishop of Cam Canterbury. Cramner gave him a brilliant solution. This would give, come to the uh, attention of the, of, uh, and would bring Cramner to the attention of the king. Why don't you ask all the theological faculties in Europe to draw up, have a debate, you know, have a conference like this, and have the theologians uh, discuss and the biblical theologians discuss what Henry should do with his marriage. And there were about 50 of these. I'm amazed that nobody's ever done a doctoral dissertation on this. Uh, uh, it'd be a fabulous doctoral dissertation. Find all of those. They, they were all published. You know, 50 theological uh, faculties discussing this, this event. And um, it'd, be like, it'd be like, you know, uh, your president has problems with his marriage. Uh, this, I have no inside knowledge. Please don't take that. And he, <laughs> he writes to the... The faculty here and says, you know, would you please have a debate, have a conference like this, two-day conference, and come up with some sort of handbook that'll help me. But not only here, but Southern and RTS and uh, et cetera, et cetera, Westminster. And, and uh, in, the, in all of that, uh, Latimer took the side of those who said Henry should take matters into his own hands and uh, annul the marriage and make himself the head of the church. And so Latimer came, he came to the attention of the king, and, and the king invites him to come and preach. And so it was, uh, although Latimer is in a little pocket village of a place called West Kingston, Wiltshire, uh, it, was a, it was a very difficult village to get to in those days. I, a no, a, a many, a, quite a number of years ago, now about 20 years ago, a friend of mine drove me there, and it was way out in the middle of nowhere. Was, I remember going down a, kind of on these typical uh, uh, English sea roads. You know, it's a one-lane road, a little lay-bys to pull in off if you saw somebody coming, and lined with gorgeous poplar trees, and, and it was very deep in the heart of the English countryside. That's where Latimer was. And, but the king would often invite him to come up and preach. And one of the things that Latimer had was he had a fearlessness and would often denounce the aristocracy in the court for their covetousness and their wealth. It would hit home to Henry. One of the reasons why Henry came, came up with a brilliant idea of, 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 a, of a divorcing Catherine and make himself the head of the church because he realized that if he did so, upwards of one-third of the property of England was owned by the Roman Catholic Church. It would now all be his Brilliant. And Latimer was not afraid to stand before these people and denounce their covetousness. In 1530, he wrote a letter to Henry. We've been hearing about the importance of the preaching of the word, of the, the, the publication of the word of God. And obviously, pre biblical preaching is rooted in the word. And Latimer wrote a letter. It's a very courageous letter to the king urging him to freely allow William Tyndale's Bible, New Testament, portions of the Old, to circulate freely in England. He began by emphasizing that it was utterly necessary for him as a preacher of God's Word to be totally truthful with the king. The holy doctor St. Augustine, in an epistle which he wrote to Cassiolanus, saith that he who for fear of any power hides the truth provokes the wrath of God to come upon him, for he fears men more than God. The holy man, St. John Chrysostom, saith, he is not only a traitor to the truth, who openly for truth teaches a lie, but he, but he also who does not freely pronounce and show the truth that he knows. These sentences, most redoubtable king, when I read now, of, when I read now of late, 
and marked them earnestly in the inward parts of my heart. They made me sore afraid and troubled and vexed me grievously in my conscience and at the last drove me to the strait that either I must show forth such things as I've read and learned in Scripture or else be of those who provoke the wrath of God upon them and are traitors to the truth. And then he went on to tell Henry why he was writing to him. My purpose in writing to you is for the love I have to God principally. That's critical. And the glory of his name, which is only known by his word. And for the true allegiance, I owe your grace. And not to hide in the ground of my heart the talent given me by God, but to chaffer, that is, speak it forth to others, that it may increase to the pleasure of God. He then pled with Henry, do not allow anybody to prevent those free circulation of the Word of God. Every parish church needs the Scriptures. He then emphasized that there was persecution in England. Henry was part of the problem. He'd actually put a, put a, put a uh, price on the head of William Tyndale. That's what makes this even more bolder. Uh, uh, Henry had actually indicated that there would be a sum of money for anybody who would uh, have him captured. In the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, saith our Savior Christ also, Lo, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. So the true preachers go like harmless sheep and are persecuted, and yet they revenge not their wrong, but remit all to God. So far as they from persecuting any other, but with the word of God only, which is their weapon. And so this is the most evident token that our Savior Jesus Christ would that his gospel and the preachers of it should be known by, that it should be despised among worldly wise men, and that they should repute it but foolishness and deceivable doctrine, and the true preachers should be persecuted and hated and driven from town to town, and yea, at the last, lose both goods and life. He has no idea that he's really kind of predicting his own future, but here he's, he's laying out, this is, this is the way the world treats the preaching of the word. Wherefore, take it as a sure conclusion that where the word of God is truly preached, there is persecution, as well as of the hearers and of the preachers. Where there is quietness and rest in worldly pleasure, there is not the truth. The plain speaking in this letter was typical of his preaching. He often used rhetorical creativity and dynamic delivery to convey biblical truth. One occasion he pulled out, he was preaching two sermons on, uh, on a, a number of biblical passages, and he, to illustrate his point, he pulled out a deck of cards, they're known as the Sermon on the Cards, and began to use the various faces on the cards to illustrate his points. So he's not afraid to use kind of a, you know, dynamic illustrations but he was ever a plain speaking preacher. 20 years, after this, uh, uh, 20 years after this letter to Henry VIII, he penned a description of Jonah's sermon. He was preaching a sermon on Jonah. Uh, he used Jonah as an example of the, uh, in a sermon, uh, Beware of Covetousness. And he said of Jonah's sermon to the inhabitants of Nineveh, it's a summary portrayal of the sort of sermon, it's a summary portrayal of the sort of sermons he himself often delivered. He says this of Jonah's sermon, and when I, when I read it, this, is, this characterizes his preaching. Here in the sermon of Jonah is no great curiousness, no great clerkliness, and by that he means an academic display that is, that is no, 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 no application to the lives of people, no great affectation of words, no painted eloquence. That little phrase, painted eloquence, that's, that's a very old phrase. It goes all the way back into people like Chrysostom, Cyprian. Jonah's sermon was a nipping sermon. It was a pinching sermon. It was a biting sermon. And that's his sermons. In the summer of 1535, Latimer's preaching gifts led to his being consecrated Bishop of Worcester. I mean, the king still opposed, it's amazing, the king is still opposed to Reformation doctrine. He, uh, Tyndale's being arrested and will be martyred the following year. And here he's appointing this great Reformation preacher as the Bishop of Worcester. Worcestershire was probably the most neglected diocese in England. It had been occupied by Italian bishops 
for nearly 40 years prior to Latimer, not one of them had ever set foot in England. This is typical of the medieval church. You, 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 you would take a, 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 somebody would take a high position, then find somebody to do some of the duties, you pay them a third of the salary or quarter of the salary, and the rest of your money, money goes into your own pocket. It, 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 it's a massive amount of nepotism in the, in the papacy. You have the, a number of the late medieval popes appointing eight-year-old archbishops of things like Milan and, and Madrid and so on, and they have, obviously have somebody fulfill the role, and then the money would go into their coffers. Latimer's immediate processor, predecessor, Geronimo de Genucci, had never once been in England. Not surprisingly, there were ministers of the diocese who didn't even own a copy of the Latin Bible. We were hearing about how the, the Latin Bible was revised by a number of the, uh, uh, Reforma uh, the uh, Renaissance humanists. Uh, many of these people didn't even own a copy of the Vulgate. Latimer frequently encountered people who were completely ignorant of the Word of God. These ministers rarely preached. In his famous sermon on the plow, Latimer compared the rarity of such preaching to strawberries. This is a, it's a great comparison. And strawberries only come for a very brief season. At least they do in England. The preaching of the Word of God unto the people is called meat. Scripture calleth it meat, not strawberries that come but once a year and tarry not long, but are soon gone. It is meat. It's not dainties. The people must have meat that must be familiar and continually and daily given to them, feed upon. Many make a strawberry of it, ministering it but once a year. But such do not hold the office of good preachers. What he began to do then was he did two strategies. One was to begin to visit all of the, all of the parish churches in his diocese and um, to find out what, what, what is the state of life on the ground. And he, There's a very famous account where he writes to one par parish church and he, he tells them a few weeks in advance, I'm, I'm coming and I'm, uh, I'll be preaching on this occasion. This is the text I'll be preaching on. And so he gets to the town and there's not a soul to be seen at the church. The church is actually all locked up. Well, he waits for about half an hour and for somebody to show up. And no one did. So he goes into the village to find out the reason why no one was at the church. And he was told by one of the inhabitants, he encounters him. He, Sir, this man said to him, this is a busy day with us. We cannot hear you. It's Robin Hood's day. Robin Hood is that legend, you know, who robbed from the poor and robbed from the rich and gave to the poor and whatever. And when later, when recounting this incident, Latimer said, and when he recounted it, there must have been a lot of people giggling. This is no laughing matter, my friends. It is a weeping matter, a heavy matter, a heavy matter, under the pretense of gathering for Robin Hood to put out a preacher, to have his office less esteemed, to prefer Robin Hood to the ministry of God's Word, that the bishops had been preachers, there should never have been such thing. In a recent article on uh, mirth and religion in 16th century England, Phoebe Jensen has noted, Latimer was not opposed to recreation per se. What he objected to were amusement that competed with the preaching of the word, that competed with the worship of God on the Lord's Day. And thus he lamented the people of his village preferred Robin Hood before the ministry of God's word. To Latimer's way of thinking, the great calling of the bishops of England was to be preachers of the word. Without preaching, Latimer was assured, Latimer was assured there was no hope for England. In his words, already cited, take away preaching and we take away salvation. Preaching was central to God's work of salvation. Latimer was not surprised, therefore, that preaching be the thing the devil wrestleth most against. It hath been all his study to decay this office. He worketh against it as much as he can. Again, when faced with the following argument, what need we preachers? God can save his elect without preachers. Latimer replied, I must keep the way God hath ordained. The office of preaching is the only ordinary way that God hath appointed to save us all by. 
Latimer was well aware it was not merely the act of preaching, though, that saved sinners. Uh, a number of uh, articles on Latimer talk about his, uh, his sacramentalism that he attaches to preaching. And I, there's some truth to that, but there's, as, you, as you peruse Latimer's sermons, he is very, very well aware it's not simply the act of preaching, but it's God opening hearts through this God-given means. To quote again from one of his later sermons, Preachers can do no more but call. God is he that must bring in. God must open the hearts as it is in the Acts of the Apostles. When Paul preached to the women, there was a silk woman, Lydia, whose heart God opened. None could open it but God. Paul could only but preach. God must work. God must do the thing inwardly. And so one of his strategies as the Bishop of Worcester was to tour the diocese and preach. And he saw himself as a, in the early patristic understanding of a, of a bishop as a preacher-teacher, almost as a missionary preacher. The second strategy was to appoint preachers, to train up men to preach. During his time as Bishop of Worcester, Latimer sought to reform the parish churches in his diocese by appointing preachers who would preach scriptural doctrine and be explicitly critical of false doctrines like praying to the saints, the power of relics, the spiritual usefulness of pilgrimages, purgatory, and the efficacy of masses celebrated for the dead. Three of the men whom he appointed during this period of time would be martyred. Thomas Gerard, Robert Barnes, Roland Taylor. Roland Taylor was married to the niece of William Tyndale. He was Bishop of Worcester only four years. In 1539, if you know anything about Henry's marriages, he's up and down. Um, he's, he, divor he annuls the marriage with Catherine of Aragon, then he marries Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn, in her latter days, is committed to the Reformation. That's very, very important. But she can't bear him a son. She buries him a daughter, Elizabeth I, and she has a stillborn son. Henry's convinced it's her problem, and he trumps up charges of adultery, has her executed. He then marries Jane Seymour, a very strong evangelical, and she bears the son who would become Edward VI, but regretfully she dies of septicemia two days after, two weeks after the birth of Edward, and then he marries Anne of Cleves, uh, which has a kind of a funny element to it. Uh, Thomas Cromwell, who, um, I don't know any of you watched Wolf Hall, fabulous, it's a fabulous series, give me a whole different view of Cromwell, I, really for me Cromwell was just a kind of a slimy uh, sycophant who made his way up into power, but Wolf Hall has changed that a little. I, I probably need at some point to read about Thomas Cromwell, but uh, Thomas Cromwell arranged a marriage with the Lutheran princess, Anne of Cleves. Uh, they'd never seen each other, so a picture of Henry, about 25 years younger, was sent to her. You know, Henry was quite a dashing man when he was, when he was in his prime, well over six feet tall, beautiful shock of red hair, and very gifted in many ways, and a uh, picture of Anna Cleese was sent, ooh, probably a bit younger too. Uh, when they each saw each other, it was, they were horrified. <laughs> uh, uh, I won't mention, uh, uh, Henry said some very nasty things to her. And uh, he chopped off Thomas Cromwell's head. That's the man that Henry's like. And then he, then he marries a Catholic, uh, Catherine Howard, one of the great Howard family, the Dukes and Duchesses of Norfolk. And she's a Catholic. And so suddenly now the Catholics are back in vogue, and Henry passes an, uh, an act called the Act of Six Articles, which required belief in transubstantiation, clerical celibacy, the legitimacy of private masses, and auricular confession, that is confession of your sins to a priest. And there was no way Latimer could agree, and he went into retirement. In fact, he not simply went into retirement, he was arrested. He was arrested with Thomas Gerard, Tom, Robert Barnes. They were martyred. He languished in prison for a period of a number of months, expecting a similar fate. He was eventually released, but told he would, could not preach in Oxford, Cambridge, or Worcester. Everything changes with the accession of Edward in 1547. Edward the young Josiah, as Calvin called him. And we know now that he, the older view was that he was manipulated by men around him like Cramner and Latimer. But it's very evident now, uh, Dermot McCulloch in Tudor Church Militants, it's a fabulous book, shows that Edward was as committed to the Reformation by the age of 12 
and 13 as any of these older clerics. And, uh, and so uh, he is invited to accept a bishopric. He doesn't take one. Instead, he does two things. He spends time in, 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 in London helping Thomas Cramner revise worship and producing that jewel of spirituality, the Book of Common Prayer, which if you're not familiar with, you need to hear with, go out and buy a copy of the 1552 or even the 1662 revised edition, uh, which is in many ways just as good. It's a tremendous body of spirituality. And, and uh, often that's attributed totally to Cramner, but Latimer was involved in that. And the other thing that Latimer did, he was invited by a woman named Catherine Willoughby. And I've only recently, within the last year, begun, kind of discovered Catherine Willoughby. She is a remarkable woman. She's known as the Puritan Duchess, or as one person said, tongue-in-cheek, the high priestess of Puritanism. I don't know how you put those two together. But uh, she was the Duchess of Suffolk, the, probably the wealthiest woman in England besides the Queen. And she asked Latimer, would you come up to one of her houses, her estates, in a place called Grimsthorpe in Lincolnshire, and be my preacher? And you can have free course to preach in the, in, on her estate and all the surrounding villages. And we, we, we possess about, we only possess, he, he preached upwards of probably two, 3,000 sermons. We have 41 28 of which were preached in the time that he spent at the estate of the Catherine Willoughby, the Duchess of Suffolk. He would preach there during that time, two sermons every Sunday. Uh, during the weekdays, he would be up at 2 in the morning to prepare his sermons, obviously by candlelight. His commitment to the scriptures, their truth is well seen by a comment he made in 1552 in one of his sermons. He was speaking about the Roman Catholic concern for unity and the implicit critique that the Reformation was wrong because it split the church. Latimer's response was simple. Desiring unity was biblical. He refers to 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul's exhortation be of one mind, but he stressed, we ought never to regard unity so much that we would or should forsake God's word. For her sake. These sermons, uh, we, we don't have them from his hand. They were written down by a stenographer. Uh, the person who wrote them down is not known. Um, he would have performed a similar task to that fabulous individual, Denis Ragunier, who wrote down Calvin's sermons. I, I, if somebody knows, I would love to know if there's a biography. I'm, I'm off topic here, I'm sorry. I'd love to know if there's a, a, a biography of Denis Ragunier. I, I, if there's a, it'd be fabulous to have something about this remarkable man whom the company of elders appointed to copy down all of Calvin's sermons. Well, such was this case in, uh, in the, uh, the Countess of, of uh, Duchess of Suffolk's home. Uh, they would copy down uh, uh, Latimer's sermons. It must have been extremely difficult. Uh, there was a torrent of eloquence, we're told, that would flow out of him. He was fluent. His sermons were, were, were ones in which he would explicate a biblical text, explain its context, explain points of doctrine, emphasize moral lessons. He was very, he was, he was plain speaking uh, regarding the national sins of England. He would warn against the errors of the Roman church, and they are all suffused with, the, with, with what Alan Chester has called a heartfelt earnestness. Was he an expository preacher? Right, Calvin, in following Zwingli's lead, picks up that early patristic, uh, that patristic method that you see in Chrysostom of preaching through books. Was that Latimer's approach? We only have 41 sermons, as I said. Uh, seven of them are, follow that method. They're on the sermon, uh, the Lord's Prayer. So we don't know. Let me give you a couple of snippets. Here is Latimer speaking about the necessity of knowing Christ for salvation. He preached this on the day of St. John the Apostle, which is December the 27th. The year was 1552. By Christ's passion, which he has suffered, he merited that as many as believe in him shall be as well justified by him as though they themselves had never done any sin. 
as though they themselves had fulfilled the law to the uttermost. For we, without him, are under the curse of the law. The law condemneth us. The law is not able to help us. Yet the imperfection is not in the law, but in us. For the law itself is holy and good, but we're not able to keep it. And so the law condemneth us. But Christ, with his death, hath delivered us from the curse of the law. He has set us at liberty and promiseth that when we believe in him, we shall not perish. The law shall not condemn us. Therefore, let us study to believe in Christ. Let us put all our hope, trust, and confidence only in him. Let us patch him with nothing. For as I told you before, our merits are not able to deserve everlasting life. It is too precious a thing to be merited by man. It is his doing only. God hath given him unto us to be our deliverer and to give us everlasting life. Oh, what a joyful thing this is. And here you again, you get this, this note of joy. During one of the sermons that he preached in the household of Catherine Willoughby, it was on the petition, Thy kingdom come, he said this, Happy is he to whom it is given to suffer for God's holy word's sake. And it's almost a prediction of his own end. Three years later, during the bloody reign of Mary I, Edward dies. He, he was never a young, he was never a healthy boy. And at 16, he contracted measles, which went into pneumonia and killed him in 1553. There was a very brief period. Uh, Edward changed his father's will and made Jane Grey, you may have heard of her, a uh, remarkable young woman. He made her uh, his heir. And for nine or ten days, Jane Grey was a queen, was queen of England. She signed three official documents. She was a solid, solid evangelical. I love, I'm off, I'm off, I'm off a little bit here again. I love counterfactual history. I don't know, I have a very close friend, Dr. Tom Nettles, and we've had debates about this. He, he thinks all, all those sorts of things are really kind of just fan, fancy and fantasy and Shouldn't bother the time of historians. But I love the idea of what if. And to do it really well, you have to know a lot of the, the things that might have been going on in the time. And I've often asked, what if Jane Grey had survived as queen? She did not. Mary, the, Mary, uh, the, uh, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, was no, was no way she was going to allow uh, the situation in England, uh, the throne, to be taken away from her. And so she staged a coup d'etat and seized power in 1553, and began to systematically arrest all of the key leaders. She had the, the, uh, the narrow-minded view that the Reformation in England was limited to a few hundred, maybe a couple of thousand, you know, clerics in Oxford and Cambridge. If she got rid of them or drove them out of the country, the rest of England would willingly follow her back into the Church of Rome. She was sadly mistaken. She arrested Latimer and his fellow bishop, Nicholas Ridley. They were initially committed to the Tower of London in September of 1553. And then in April 1554, they were taken to the Bacado prison in Oxford. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. It's roughly where, if you know Oxford, it's Broad Street, that road that goes down to Blackwell's, that famous bookstore uh, where I've spent far too much money in my life. And uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a ditch. And the, wall, the walls of the, the old wall city were right there. And Bacardo Prism was on, attached to the wall. And that's where he was imprisoned with Thomas Cramner, the Archbishop of Canterbury. All three were found guilty of heresy. While he was in the Bacardo, Latimer wrote a lengthy letter to a friend, which run, part of which runs like this. Soap, though it be black, interesting name, must have had black soap. Soileth not the cloth, but maketh it clean. So doth the black cross of Christ help us to more whiteness. The, the images there are interesting, the, the, the imagery of color. and uh, Interesting to know why he's using that, but that's, a, that's another story too. I've got, a, I've got a fascination with the theology of color which a lot of friends of mine think is, is, is weird, but anyway. If God strike with the, uh, the, the, the black cross of Christ, help us to more whiteness, if God strike with a battle door, because you be God's sheep, prepare yourselves 
for the slaughter, always knowing in the sight of God our death is precious. Die once we must. Where? We know not how. Happy are they whom God giveth to pay nature's debt. I mean to die for his sake. Here is not our home. Let us therefore accordingly consider things having always before our eyes the heavenly Jerusalem and the way thereto by persecution. On October the 16th, 1555, Lanner and Ridley were taken out of Oxford through the Bacardo Grate where they were tied to a stake in what is now Broad Street. You can actually still go there if you've never been there and you go to Oxford, there is a cross in the, in the cobblestones on Broad Street, and then opposite on the wall of what is now St. John's College, a plaque that tells you what that cross means. It was at that spot that Ridley and Latimer in the fall of 1555, and then uh, Cramner in the spring of 1556 gave their lives for the gospel. The wood was piled around both bishops, but the wood that was piled around Ridley was green, just being freshly cut, that around Latimer was seasoned. Ridley was, a, was, was a, asked if he could say some words. He was told, yes, if you are prepared to deny your erroneous, your, your erroneous opinions. If not, you must hold your tongue. Well, Ridley said, as long as breath is in my body, I will never deny my Lord Christ and his known truth. And then the, the, the wood was lit. But Ridley's, the wood around Ridley couldn't bur wasn't burning. And at one point he cried out, I this is horrifying, I cannot burn. Lord, have mercy on me. Latimer, and Latimer's response is sermonic. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. Amen.